So open your Bibles with me this morning to Revelation chapter 10. As we continue our study through this book and through this chapter that I have entitled Halftime. Halftime. Now, since it's been three weeks now since we've been in Revelation 10, I'm going to go ahead and just give you, by way of introduction, uh, information about this chapter that you need. I already shared this with you before when we began the chapter, but since it's been several weeks, uh, I want to share it again. Here in chapter 10, we come to the halfway point of the future tribulation period, and this chapter will provide a much-needed halftime for everybody on the planet during that time. Since the beginning of the tribulation back in verse 1 of chapter 6 of Revelation, most of those dwelling upon the earth will have been running the wrong way in response to God's wrath via the seal judgments of chapter 6 and the trumpet judgments of chapters 8 and 9, which will result in the loss of of over half the world's population in that day. So here in chapter 10, we come to a break in the action. Chapter 10 introduces us to the third, or I'm sorry, it introduces us to the second of three parenthetical sections. And it comes between the sounding of the sixth uh, trumpet judgment in chapter 9 and the seventh trumpet judgment at the end of chapter 11. The purpose of these parenthetical sections is to introduce John and his readers to important people that are pertinent to the events of the end times. So here in chapters 10 and 11, uh, we meet three more important players in the last day scenario. Here in chapter 10, we're introduced to a mighty angelic messenger and in chapter 10, we, or I'm sorry, in chapter 11, we're introduced to two real Jehovah Witnesses, witnesses that God sends forth to prophesy to the nation of Israel and, of course, to the world. God will use all three, this strong angel that we see here in chapter 10, and those two witnesses, God will use them during halftime in order to inspire and pep up the people toward repentance, which is another purpose of these parenthetical sections in Revelation. The purpose of them is to give everyone on earth ample opportunity to repent of their sin. And so after the torturous trumpet judgments of chapters 8 and 9, what God's going to do at this point of the tribulation, He calls a time out at this three and a half year mark to give mankind yet another opportunity to turn to Him before He finally pours out the last and the worst series of judgments. And it's the worst of them all. Those are the bold judgments that will be released in chapter 16. And so here in chapter 10, John sees the appearance of a mighty, angelic messenger. And so here in verse 1, we looked at verse 1 the last two times we were in the book of Revelation, and what we see in verse 1 is the appearance of the angel. Not just the appearance of the angel in the fact that he shows up, but his appearance, what he looked like. And so what we learned in studying verse 1 a little bit in depth is we learned that this angel in verse 1 is a high-ranking heavenly messenger who has come from God with great authority. That's who he is. He's not the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not a picture of the second coming. This is God sending this messenger to John to give him more information about what's going to happen in the future at the halfway mark of the tribulation period. That's what's going on. So if you would look at verse 1, John says... I saw still another mighty angel. The word another there means another one of the same kind. Where in the book of Revelation did we find already a mighty angel or strong angel? Back in chapter 5. 
So we know this isn't the Lord Jesus. This is a, another mighty angel, another one of the same kind like we already saw in this book, which we find back in chapter 5. Okay? So notice his appearance here. He was coming down from heaven. That means he's a heavenly messenger, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. Okay? Now, we've talked about all that in depth. I want to move on now. And what we're going to start looking at today is verses 2 through 7. Verses 2 through 7. And what we see now is the actions by the angel. In verse 1, we see the appearance of the angel. In, verse, in verses 2 through 7, now we see the actions of the angel. And look at verse 2. It says that he had a little book that was opened in his hand. And so the first action we see by the angel is he's holding a book. He's holding a book. Now what's interesting is uh, the Greek word for book here could be translated as book or as scroll uh, just as it is back in Revelation chapter 5. Okay, Back in Revelation chapter 5, the New King James Version interprets this same word uh, at least it's the same word as far as its root. It interprets it as a scroll. Here it interprets it as a book. But the two are one and the same. Okay? Because at this point in history, most of their books were scroll form. Okay? So he's holding this little book. And what book is this? This is the big question. Now I'm going to tell you, as you go through this chapter and you read what smart people have to say about what's going on in chapter 10 and about all the details, and what I mean by smart people is Bible scholars and commentators and such, you can get very confused because on a lot of these points, good, reputable Bible teachers disagree. Okay? So, when it comes to this book, there are lots of suggestions. Uh, I'm going to give you the two that I think are the most plausible according to the context. Some suggest that this book is the seven-sealed scroll that Jesus took out of the right hand of God the Father back in Revelation chapter 5, verse 7. Do you all remember that? Okay? If so, then what this little book is, it is the title deed to the earth. And that title deed to the earth, which Jesus, the Lamb of God, back in chapter 5 took out of the right hand of God the Father, that scroll had seven seals, and as Jesus opened each seal, what happened was a judgment was poured out upon the earth. Right? Thus, the, the uh, seven seal judgments. Okay? So, back in chapter 5, Jesus was the only one worthy to be able to take that book or that scroll and open its seals and unleash judgment on mankind. Why? Because, number one, the earth belongs to Him by right of creation. He created it. God, through Christ, created the world. It's His. But through Adam's sin, this world, as we know it right now in the world system, was usurped by Satan himself. That's why... Satan is called in the New Testament the God of this world. Jesus, through His death and through what He did on the cross and His resurrection, redeemed everything that was lost due to Adam's sin. Dominion over the earth, okay, as well as the, as the souls and spirits of mankind. Jesus has redeemed the earth it belongs, it, he took it back, okay? It's his by right of creation, but it's also his by right of redemption. He redeemed it as God in human flesh, dying for our sins. But he redeemed us, uh, first and foremost, from our sins through faith in him, okay? So what's interesting is this title deed to the earth gives Jesus the right now to take possession of it and to rule it. So as creator and redeemer, 
The world belongs to him. Okay? Now, if you want more in-depth information about that, go to YouTube, go to our, our teachings that we did through Revelation chapter 5, and all this is explained in depth. Okay? So what's interesting is, some suggest, and a lot of really good Bible scholars, Pastor Chuck Smith, uh, when he was alive, he believed this was the case. David Jeremiah, J. Verda McGee, a lot of really solid teachers believe this is what this little book is. And I want you to notice now that this book is open. Okay? This is another good argument for this being the seven sealed scroll, seven sealed scroll back in Revelation chapter 5, because the book is open. The Greek word that is translated open here is a verb in the perfect passive tense. Aren't you glad I told you that? Huh? You might want to write that down. What's that mean? It means that it indicates that someone had already opened it. See? And it was ready, it was already unrolled in his hand. So if this is the seven sealed scroll from Revelation chapter 5, who was it that already opened this scroll or this book? Jesus. He takes it now, hands it to the angel. The angel now brings it and appears in front of John with it in his hand open. Do you see that? So, again, who opened it? Jesus. Beginning in chapter 6 and concluding in chapter 8, Jesus opens all seven seals, releasing the first two series of judgments, of, uh, the first two series of seven judgments, which were the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments. Now, why do I say the trumpet judgments? Is because, if you remember, when the seventh seal was loosed and opened, what that did is that then began the trumpet judgments. So the trumpet judgments, okay, came out of that seventh seal. When that seventh seal was released by Jesus, then now that led to the seven trumpet judgments. So that's why I say that. This book, the scroll that Jesus had in his hand that he opened, and this book the angel now has, contains the judgments of the great tribulation by which the Lord Jesus, through pouring out his judgment upon the earth, what he is doing is this. He is showing mankind that he is reclaiming his ownership and rule of the earth. Mankind, since Adam, has had his rule on earth. And guess what man has done? He's made it a mess. So Jesus is coming to reclaim what is His. The earth itself and the ruling over it. And so, the book is now open and the judgments are in full swing here in Revelation 10. The book is the angel's authority for claiming the earth for Christ. So when the angel shows up, he's coming as an emissary, as a representative, as a messenger of the Lord Jesus Christ, saying, with the, open, with the open scroll in his hand, saying, this all belongs to the Lord. Okay? Now, it's interesting, because if you remember, it was, as I already said, it was one mighty angel, back in Revelation chapter 5, verse 2, who drew everyone's attention in heaven to the scroll that was in God's hand, right? It was an angel, a mighty angel, it says, a strong angel that drew the attention of everyone in heaven to the scroll in God's hand, Revelation 5, 2. And now it's another mighty or strong angel who brings the open scroll to John. Now, why do I point that out? I point that out because I think it's interesting that the transfer of this book, listen, the transfer of the book of Revelation that you hold in your hand, the transfer of that book was as follows. It was transferred from God, from God's hand, to Jesus' hand. Or, I'm sorry, it was, it was uh, transferred from God's hand to John's hand, and it followed the same sequence 
as when John received the book of Revelation. So let me say that again because I totally messed it up. This book that we're reading here um, in chapter 10, the open book that the angel has in his hand, okay, it has in his hands. It's transferred from God's hand to John's hand. But the sequence it followed, okay, followed, it followed the same sequence as when John received the book of Revelation. So I actually had that backwards. Sorry. Got a lot on my mind with that broken string, I'm telling you. <laughs> and Main Street. <laughs> anyway. You see, you see what I'm saying? So the transfer of this little book that the angel has opened in his hand from God to John followed the same sequence as when God got the book of Revelation to John. What was that sequence? Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 tells us. Here's what it says. The revelation of Jesus Christ, talking about the book of Revelation, which God, see where it starts? Which God gave Him. Who's the Him here? Jesus. Which God gave Jesus to show His servants, right, of which John is one of those, the things which must shortly take place. And then He sent and signified it by His angel to His servant John. Do you see that? So what was the sequence? From God to Jesus, to an angel, to John. Okay? So that same sequence was used to get the book of Revelation from God to John. That same sequence is being used here in chapter 10 to get this little book from God to John. Okay? So, very interesting. Others would suggest now that this little book, the angel holding his hand, it's actually not the seven seal scroll to Revelation, chapter 5, but some would suggest that this book contains the rest of the book of Revelation, which would include the last series of seven judgments, the bold judgments. So there are those who believe that what this little book contained was the rest of the judgments to be poured out uh, in the second half of the tribulation, okay? Which it does include that. Others believe that this little book is literally the second half of the book of Revelation, okay? Uh, especially the second half of the tribulation and, and what pertains to it. Okay, I can see that. Makes sense. Why? Because here in chapter 10... We're at the halfway point of the tribulation, and we're, if, you, if you notice how many chapters are in the book of Revelation, we're like at the halfway point of the book of Revelation too. You see that? So, that's one view. In fact, uh, one really good modern uh, prophecy teacher by the name of Mark Hitchcock, here's what he had to say about this. He says, if the little book is not the seven-sealed scroll of chapters 5 and 6, then what is it? The little scroll is probably the revelation from God about the remainder of the contents of Revelation in chapters 11 through 22. It's the rest of the prophetic message that John will record. Revelation chapter 10 verse 11 supports the notion because John eats the little book and then he prophesies again. These prophecies are the extent... I'm sorry... The prophecies are the context of the little book. He eats the book, and then once he has taken it in, he speaks the rest of the prophecies in Revelation, or literally writes them down. Okay, so do you see that view? And there are, again, good Bible teachers who hold that view, that this little scroll is literally volume two. <laughs> For John, of the book of Revelation. It's the rest of the book. Listen, either way, either view you take, we do know this, that what's in that little scroll is prophecy, okay, for John, that is new revelation that he hasn't seen yet, it hasn't been given to him yet, hasn't been revealed to him yet, 
It's, it's revelation that he hasn't received yet, but it's prophetic revelation. It, it, is, it is prophecy. Okay, and how do we know? Come down with me to verse 8. Look at verse 8 in chapter 10. The voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I looked, I'm sorry, then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, after John ingests the little book, then the angel says to him, you must prophesy again. Do you see that? So what's in this little book? Prophecy. Prophecy. Revelation that John hasn't had yet about the future. More prophecy. And he says you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. So either way, however you want to look at this little book, we know this. It is a book of prophecy. Now notice that there's a book. It's open. But notice the adjective that's attached to it. It's little. It's a little book. Right? Well, why is it just a little book? Well, if this book contains the rest of the book of Revelation, then it only contains half the book. Okay? Which would give us an idea of why it seems little. It's not the whole Revelation. It's just half of it. The second half. Okay? So that might be one of the reasons why John describes it as little. If this book is the scroll that Jesus opened, then it contains all the judgments of the Great Tribulation, which actually is a very short period of time. This also may be why this book is little. Because this book only covers a period of seven years. Okay? Uh, when you look at the book of Revelation in your Bible, compared to other books, you know, it's 22 chapters, but it's not really that long of a book compared to Isaiah or the book of Psalms. You see what I'm saying? That might be another reason why to John it seems like a little book is because the contents it's covering is only a very short period of time. According to Daniel in Daniel 9.27, the tribulation period is only seven years, right? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 22, and unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Jesus actually says the tribulation period, time of God's judgment poured up, uh, out upon a rebellious, uh, unbelieving, Christ-rejecting world, God has actually shortened that time. It's a short period of time. Okay? And why did God make it short? One of the reasons is Jesus said if God hadn't whittled down the tribulation period, His judgment upon mankind on earth, if He hadn't whittled it down to seven years, Jesus said no one would survive it. It's going to be that bad. Do you see that? So it's a short period of time. That's my, that, why, that may be why it's a little book. And then there's others who say this. They, they say that the book isn't really that little. It just appears little compared to the angel who's holding it. You know what I'm saying? Listen, there, there's some big dudes that look little, okay, standing next to Andre the Giant, if you know who he was. The old wrestler, the seven, you know, seven foot one tall. I saw a picture just the other day. It just popped up on social media. I get all this wrestling stuff when it pops up on social media. I think it's Ed Mitchell's fault. <laughs> but but I, I get this. And there was a picture of Andre the Giant standing there and some other big dudes with him. Okay, and this was an old picture when he was younger. 
And he makes those big dudes look little. Okay? So some people have the idea that that's why John records this as a little book because the little book in the angel's hand, the angel is so big that the book looks little. It appears little. Okay? So that's maybe the, maybe, you know, the truth. And, and why... Here's what's interesting. If, if you study other folks who study the book of Revelation, read their commentaries, read their insights on the book of Revelation. I haven't read one yet who doesn't believe that this angel is gigantor. They believe he's a, he's, he's a mighty angel, but they also believe that he's humongous. He's gigantic. Okay? Why do they say that? Well, look at the rest of the verse. Look at verse 2. Look at the rest of it. He had a little book open in his hand. Well, could it be that the book appears little because he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land? Because of that description there, most Bible scholars and Bible commentators will say this angel was huge. He was humongous. And he was so big that his one foot was on the sea. His other foot was on the land. That's how big he was. You know, if you kind of get that picture, imagine yourself at the beach and someone's so tall that they got one foot out in the middle of the ocean and one foot, you know, on shore. It's interesting because this is the idea that most people get by reading this. Okay? So the idea they get uh, is that this angel is just a colossus. Okay? So the second action we see by this angel is that he puts his foot down or puts his feet down on the earth. And because he put one foot on the sea and the other foot on the land, some conclude that this angel is gigantic. Okay? And some give you the idea that, again, he's like a colossus. Now, when John wrote this, his readers would have known from history about what is called the Colossus of Rhodes. Okay? The Colossus of Rhodes was a statue that was built in Rhodes, which was an island between Crete and Turkey. The magnificent statue of Apollo, the sun god, was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It stood about 105 feet high. One foot was on the island, and the other foot was on the mainland. It was the greatest statue ever built in the ancient world, historians say. And it was so big that ships, because it was so big and its position, that ships would sail in the waterway between the statue's legs. So some Bible commentators will give you the idea that this angel was like the Colossus of Rhodes. Just massive, huge, tall, big, you know. It is interesting because in extra-biblical Jewish writings called the Talmud. Have you ever heard of the Talmud? The Talmud is rabbinical writings, the writings of the rabbis, uh, giving the Jewish people interpretations of Scripture and giving them insights and spiritual things. Well, in the Talmud, the rabbis, actually in, in one certain uh, section, they actually discuss an angel by the name of Sandalphon. Okay? And in that discussion they have, they actually talk about his enormous height, that he was the same as the distance of 500 miles taller than other angels. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that, that, would, that would even be more ridiculous than Manute, Manute Bowl. You guys remember him? He was an, he was an African um, who played, he was a, where was he from? What nation? I mean, he was one from one of the African nations. 
But uh, man, he's, he was like one of the tallest men ever lived on the earth. But he was a NBA player. Uh, huge, just tall, massively tall. If he came in here this morning, you know, he would look like he's 500 miles taller than the rest of us, you know. But it's interesting that Jewish rabbis had this idea of this angel named Sandalphon, that he was that much taller than the rest of the angels. So could there be any truth to this, that this angel is a gigantor? Yeah, I guess, you know. But anyway, um, it's interesting. But what's the, what's the real point, though, to him setting his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land? It's not to show us how tall he is, okay? The angel's posture here is that of a conqueror taking possession of his territory. When he puts one foot on the sea and one foot on the land, he's coming to say that this has been conquered and it's been claimed and this territory belongs to me. But the territory doesn't belong to him. He is a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he is coming here in Revelation 10 to tell the world, okay, that the sea, the land, the whole earth belongs, okay, to his commander in chief, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? That Jesus is the owner of the earth, okay? That's the point here, that this is his territory. So as a high-ranking angel with great authority, he is claiming the whole world on behalf of his superior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's interesting because this whole thing of putting your foot down and claiming territory as your own isn't nothing new in the Bible. We see this in the Old Testament, right? In Deuteronomy uh, chapter 11, verse 24, we see it. In the Old Testament, putting your feet down on land signified taking possession of that particular place for yourself. Deuteronomy 11.24 Here's what the Lord spoke through Moses to Israel. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. From the wilderness and, from the wilderness and Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even to the western sea, shall be your territory. God told Israel. See that? And then in Joshua chapter 1, verse 3, as Joshua is leading the nation of Israel into the land, the Lord tells him, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you as I said to Moses. So there in Joshua chapter 1, verse 3, God now reiterates to Joshua what He told Moses to tell Israel. When they come to the land, put your feet on it. Everywhere you trod, it's yours. You see that principle? So that's the imagery of what we're seeing here in verse 2. Okay? Now, here in verse 3, um, let's move on a little bit here. In verse 3, the next, ex the, the next action of the angel we see is now he makes a loud cry. He makes a loud cry. Look what it says. It says, And that he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. As when a lion roars. Now this is interesting to me because Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, that the devil roars like a lion. It says your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. Well, he's a fallen angel. So in contrast to the devil, a falling angel, here now John sees a holy angel putting his feet down on the world that has been under the sway of this fallen angel, the devil. But what's he doing? He's coming now reclaiming that world like a roaring lion, but he's doing so for the lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Right? 
That's what he's doing here. We're not told now when he cried out. We're not told what he said when he cried out. But it was probably similar to what Christopher Columbus did on his first voyage to the Americas. And I want you to listen. This is interesting. To get an idea of what the angel was doing here when he puts his feet on the sea and the land, and then he gives this big cry as when a lion roars. When Columbus arrived back in Spain on March 15, 1493, he immediately wrote a letter announcing his discoveries to King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, who had helped him finance his trip. And Columbus wrote this in this letter. I mean, this is an actual document. And here's what Columbus wrote. I discovered many islands inhabited by numerous people. I took possession of them. I'm sorry, I took possession of all of them for our most fortunate king. Listen. By making public proclamation and unfurling, unfurling his standard or his flag. So Columbus is telling King Ferdinand that when he came to the Americas, everywhere he went, there was already people there. But what he did is he showed up, as he says here, took possession of all of those places where those people were at, and he made a public proclamation, this belongs to the king of Spain, and set his flag down. <laughs> See? And that is exactly what the angel is doing here. He's showing up to the planet that is already populated with people, most of them, right, rebellious against their Creator, rebellious against God and against their Savior who died for them. And the angel shows up, puts his feet down, gives a big cry, gives a public proclamation, roaring like a lion because he is representing the Lion of the tribe of Judah, saying, this belongs to to Jesus. Say, incredible. Now, here's what's interesting. In verses 5 through 7, there is a connection between the angel standing on the sea and the land with the sounding of the seventh trumpet. This is important to this point I'm making. I want you to listen. What is the seventh trumpet? It's the proclamation of Christ's possession and rule over the earth. Okay? If you would, come down to verse 5. Look at verse 5. The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. In other words, there's God's judgment, the rest of God's judgments are coming and they're coming quick. And then he says this, But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God will be finished as he declared to his servants the prophets. What I want to show you is, here, notice, there in verse 5, the angel standing with one foot on the sea, one foot on the land, claiming the territory on behalf of Jesus, it belongs to him, has a connection to the seventh trumpet. What does it say concerning the seventh trumpet? I'm going to read it to you. Revelation 11:15. Here's what it says. The seventh angel sounded... And there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. You see that? So that's why I say, much like Columbus came to the Americas, set his feet down on those islands, made a a public proclamation to those who are living there. This now belongs to the king of Spain. I believe that's exactly what the angel is doing here in Revelation 10 on behalf of Jesus concerning this world that belongs to him.
You see that? Okay. Very, very interesting. Hmm? So, notice now, here in verse 3, notice it says, when he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Okay? So when the angel cries out, like the roar of a lion, there's a response. Seven thunders uttered their voices. Now, if you notice by reading the second half of verse 3, these thunders aren't just any normal thunders. Right? Because when it thunders, do you hear words? No. Look what it says. The seven thunders uttered their voices. When these seven thunders thundered, <laughs> there were words spoken. Okay? So these thunders aren't just any normal thunders. They speak. So here's the question. Whose voices are they? Whose forces are they? Well, again, as you might know, Bible scholars have different views on this. But I'm going to give you two that I think are plausible. Number one, according to Revelation 6.1, the living creatures around the throne of God in heaven have voices like thunder. Okay? We see that when we read Revelation 6.1. But most Bible commentators believe that these voices is literally the voice of God Himself. And why do they say that? They say that because of what the Bible has to say concerning God's voice sounding like thunder. Okay? Now, before I give you those verses in just a moment, J. Vernon McGee said this. He says that the seven thunders here are God's amen to the angel's claim. So when the angel came down, set his foot on the sea and the land, cried out, made the public proclamation that this belongs to the Lord Jesus, that then God gave His Amen through the seven thunders that uttered their voices. That God was saying Amen to what the angel was doing. I like that idea. Anyway, Job chapter 37 verses 4 and 5 says this, After it a voice roars. Speaking of God, He thunders with, majestic, with, a, with His majestic voice. He thunders with His majestic voice and He does not restrain them with His voice. I'm sorry. He does not restrain them when His voice is heard. God thunders marvelously with His voice. He does great things which we cannot comprehend. Psalm 18 verse 13. The Lord thundered from heaven and the Most High uttered His voice. Hailstones and coals of fire. Psalm 29, which by the way, Psalm 29 is really one of the quintessential passages of Scripture that refer to God's voice. Because the word voice is used in that short psalm seven times, referring to God's voice. I'm just going to give you verses uh, 3 and 4. It says, "...the voice of the Lord is over many waters." The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. Powerful like what? Like thunder and many waters. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. And then there's Revelation chapter 14, verse 2, which, again, some Bible scholars believe that they differ on whose voice is actually being heard in Revelation 14 too. Uh, some believe that it is God's voice, and here's what it says. If it is, it says, And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, like the voice of loud thunder. So there you have thunder, God's voice being like thunder and like the sound of many waters. Again, uh, the, this seems to be a theme in Scripture. Okay? Now, it's interesting that it links thunder, God's voice being like thunder and like the sound of many waters, right? Because it was Fleetwood Mac who told us, right? 
Uh, thunder only happens when it's raining. <laughs> right? So, anyway, just so you can get some insight there from those great theologians. Anyway, but speaking of his voice being like thunder, like many waters, when John had his vision of Jesus in chapter 1 and verse 15, it says his voice was as the sound of many waters. See the connection? Revelation chapter 4 verse 5 speaks of when, when, when John saw God on His throne in Revelation 5. Or I'm sorry, in Revelation 4. I said 5, didn't I? In Revelation 4, when John is taken up into heaven and he sees the one who's, who's, who's sitting on the throne, he says this in verse 5, and from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices, as if those voices were coming from God as thunder and lightning. And then here's one I think is very interesting. John chapter 12, verses 28 and 29. This is Jesus. Jesus says to the Father, Father, glorify your name. It says, John writes and says, Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Wow, a voice from heaven came down saying that. It says, Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Okay, now this isn't the only time where in response to Jesus or at least in confirmation of who He was, that God spoke from heaven, right? Remember when Jesus was baptized? The Holy Spirit came upon Him like a dove. And then it says, Then there was a voice that was heard from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That same thing happened, if you remember, at the transfiguration when Jesus had Peter, James, and John. And he gave them a preview of Jesus coming in his kingdom. Again, it says that God spoke from heaven and reiterated again, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Here in this passage, Jesus says, glorify your name. God speaks from heaven and says, I have, and I will do it again. <laughs> and when they heard that voice, the people said that it had thundered. So there's this idea that God's voice to man sounds like thunder. And others said, an angel was spoken to him. Maybe they're talking about some Colossus angel. It's like 500 miles tall or something. I don't know. But anyway, very interesting. So that's a good case to say that these seven thunders that thundered and uttered voices could be the voice of God Himself. But this is what's interesting, and this is where we're going to end today. We're not told what the angel cried nor what the seven thunders thundered. Or, I'm sorry, what the seven thunders uttered. Okay? So, there's a lot of mystery to this chapter and a lot of unanswered questions. Okay? And here's the point. I hope that you're good with that. Okay? Because... If you look at the next verse, if you're not okay with not knowing everything, the next verse is going to drive you crazy. Do you know those type of people? They can't let anything go. They just got to know everything. If they get wind that you know something they don't, they will pester you to death for you to tell them. Or they're just so inquisitive. They just can't give up. They just, they got to know everything about everything, about everybody. Listen, there comes a time when it's like, listen, you don't need to know everything. Everything is not for you. It's not to you. And it's not beneficial for you. Okay? So listen, it's not necessary. 
Okay? For us to know everything about everything. Okay? Even when it comes to some things in Scripture. Did the pastor just say that? Yeah, I did. And this is a perfect case. Right? Again, we're not told what the angel cried. We're not told what the seven thunders uttered. And again, as you go through this chapter, there is a lot of mystery. There's unanswered questions. And you need to be okay with that. Because if you come to verse 4, let's, let's read it. I'm not going to talk about it because I'm already out of time. This is where we'll pick up next week. Okay? But this is very insightful. I can't, I can't wait to get to this verse. But let me tell you why you need to be okay with not knowing everything. Okay? Now, that's not an excuse not to know your Bible. Whatever God has revealed, He's making you accountable to learn it, know it, and obey it. Okay? I'm almost preaching the rest of the verse 4. This is for next week. So let me just say ahead of time, when I say you need to be okay with not knowing everything there is to know about everything, even the Bible, I'm not giving you an out to say, well, I don't need to read my Bible. I don't need to study my Bible. I don't need to come to church and listen to you talk about the Bible because you said I don't need to know everything. You don't need to know everything that hasn't been revealed. Quit worrying about it. Okay? But the things that have been revealed, God holds us accountable to know about those things and to understand them and obey them. Okay? That's going to be the real punch of, of verse 4 when we get to it. But let me just read it to you. Look at verse 4. Here's why I say you need to be okay with not knowing everything. Now, when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. <laughs> what? I mean, can you imagine John? He's, he's seeing this angel. He cries out with a loud voice like a lion that roars. Seven thunders. Thunder and there's voices coming out of them. He's hearing stuff, and he's like, oh, I can't wait to write this down. I got to... And he gets ready, and the voice from heaven says, stop. Nope. Don't do it. Seal it up. Keep it hidden. Keep it secret. Don't tell anyone. So here's, here's the real quick ending to verse 4. Is this. What did the seven thunder, thunders utter that John heard? He was about to write down. What was it? We don't know. And no one knows. Okay? Even those Bible scholars who try to give you opinions about what it is, is totally foolish. It's nonsense. Don't waste a second of your time trying to dig and find out what was it that John didn't tell us? <laughs> what was it that John didn't write? We don't know because he didn't write it. And he didn't write it because he was told by a voice from heaven not to. So that's why I say, if you're one of those people, that you just got to know everything. I mean, I got to know how everything works. I gotta know the whys of everything. I gotta have all the answers. Oh, you're gonna you're gonna be you're gonna be so frustrated and so many so many times in life. Because God doesn't always give us all the information that we want. And that's where you have to come to a place where you trust the Lord. Right? Instead of leaning on your own understanding. Okay, so we're going to stop there because I'm going to break down verse 4. And I'm telling you what, there are some wonderful, wonderful lessons in verse 4 for us to learn concerning this concept 
of being okay with not knowing everything.